Hi, everybody. Yeah. Welcome Hello. back Hi. after um, our lunch break. We will talk, uh, I will talk about the idea of the job guarantee wearing two hats mm -hmm. at the same time. Um, sometimes I'll take one off or I'll wear both of them. One is the theoretical research. But the other one is um, from the standpoint of implementation. The presentation will have two parts. <coughs> The first rests on a uh, report based on research that we had done uh, here at the Institute, a job guarantee proposal for Greece um, that was completed in 2014. The first time we dealt uh, with Greece was in 2011, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but the Institute had been involved with <coughs> issues of research in view of a job guarantee in other countries prior to Greece. As you heard in the morning from Pavlina, um, India has a huge program, the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act, actually, because <coughs> it has been legislated and it is part of the rights of citizens in rural areas to have access to a limited time um, of employment uh, through this scheme during the low agricultural season because it is exclusively for agricultural areas. So when there is no work, that's the period, I wouldn't call it unemployment exactly because the terms of engagement in the labor market um, for rural, in rural areas in India are very different from what one is familiar with in formal markets. But nonetheless, there is no work around um, during that season. Um, the other country is South Africa and I was personally involved in both. I lived actually in South Africa for a period of time um, during the project and subsequently Mexico. So Greece is the fourth country where empirically uh, we got engaged with policy makers in different capacities. Uh, I'll come back to in part two um, regarding our engagement in, in Greece. So the <coughs> part one is based on the research proposal. Part two now is the evaluation of the ILO um, that I invited actually together with the European Commission uh, during my tenure as an alternate minister of labor in Greece. Uh, but more about the connection of the two um, in a little while. So a little bit background of background. Uh, between 2010 and 2015, we have two successive administrations in Greece um, that were forced one way or another to accept two rescue packages from um, the IMF, the European Central Bank, and the third was the European Commission. So there were two memorandum, memoranda of understanding that uh, were signed. And this MOU is a nicer way of saying two packages that imposed internal devaluation in the country and uh, severe austerity. What it, th this is an experience that you all are familiar with um, when a country is bailed out by IFIs. There are conditionalities upon which you sign as a country. In Latin America, we refer to that period of the 80s as the lost decade because 
of uh, exactly the impact that these packages have, but this is something quite familiar in many countries in Africa. What was not familiar was that um, such a program could also reach European countries, which it did. So as a result, between 2010 and 2015, in Greece we have 25% decline in GDP. Investment, as you can see, dropped from 60 billion to 20 billion annually. And unemployment, which is the focus of our discussion today, went from 7.8 to 27.8%. 2015, a new party gets elected. And this, um, this was the Syriza party, leftist orientation. And partly they were elected on the promise that they will do away with the austerity measures. And somehow, fairly quickly, they will get the country outside the set of obligations um, that previous governments had signed. So 200 and two, 2015 happens. And that was the time <coughs> that um, I was invited to participate, to become a member of uh, parliament, as well as um, implement, actually, what we had prepared in 2013-2014 um, as part of an agenda to get the country rapidly out of the severe recession, if not depression, that it had entered. Here you can see that despite all good intentions, in August of 2015, so the government was elected in January of 2015, by August 2015, um, all illusions were abandoned that a small country with a leftist government uh, was going to reach agreement with the European Union, the European Commission, and uh, the IFIs, uh, giving the signal, actually, uh, that whatever right-wing governments could not achieve for the country, a left-wing government was now going to deliver. Uh, that was impossible. That was an illusion, and it proved um, quite unfortunate, actually, um, for the country and for the government. Um, there were new elections that were held after the signing of the third uh, rescue package. And uh, the same party, Syriza party, was re-elected, actually, um, despite the fact that there was a third agreement on the table. So in the following years, you have the, a bit of a reversal. Um, and by 2017, you start uh, with uh, experiencing some growth. Um, foreign direct investment increases as well. And unemployment between 2015 and 2018 decreases by 7%. Um, and the question, of course, is how is it possible with zero growth, with the exception of one year, to get 300,000 uh, new jobs that were created? And I will argue that actually it was possible because of the intervention that um, the administration, the Tsipras administration, um, sought, thought appropriate to implement for the country. So, very quickly, I'll go through some slides without spending much time, as all of this is um, part, as I said, of the study that you can find at the Live Institute. And there is a policy brief that I assigned. For today, there is also a one-pager, <laughs> if one does not have uh, sufficient time to devote to this, but it is there for your information. So um, just a pictorial representation of what I was saying earlier. Um, you had close to a million jobs that were lost, beginning in 2008, actually. But you can see 
that in uh, the, the huge decline happens between 2010 and 2013. All sectors are affected, all skill levels are affected throughout the economy. We have a bust, uh, but there are three sectors that stand out, and that is manufacturing, construction, wholesale, and retail. This is a slide that shows the long-term unemployment situation. So we begin in 2007, first quarter, we end with 2013, uh, third quarter. As you recall, the study that we undertook at the Institute was um, during 2013, so in 2014 we were ready to deliver the final proposal. So that's why the selection of the data. And all I want to show you here is how long-term unemployment is the key characteristic. Not only you have huge unemployment, but also long-term unemployment. 75% of the unemployed were in long-term unemployment status. Um, here you have the profile according to education attainment, educational attainment level. And you can see again that you have unemployment reaching all layers of education, uh, but the majority of the unemployed, roughly half a million people, are those that have finished um, high school, essentially. They have completed their secondary um, education level. Youth unemployment much higher, as in all countries, in good times and bad times, you have much higher unemployment um, uh, among the youth. And again, here you can see among the young that uh, the, the majority also are found in terms of educational level um, at the level of uh, high school having finished, completed their secondary education. Comparing uh, age groups, you see identical pictures. And here I have the unemployment rates by age group um, among European countries, um, EU 17 and 27. Um, and I want you to observe that, in fact, the um, unemployment rate of the young is much higher than um, the more aged uh, working population. But what is critical to keep in mind is the difference between the unemployment rate and the share of age groups in total number in the total number of the unemployed because when you look at it from this perspective you will see that for example in Greece 87 percent of the 1.2 million people that were unemployed are not young the youth accounts for only 13 percent in the total number so if you are to design a program it is not actually very wise to look at unemployment rates in the different cohorts. Even regionally, you should not do that. You should look at the share of each group and category that you're interested in um, so that you can prioritize accordingly. And finally, at risk of poverty rate, what can I say? The picture says it all for you. Um, this is 2014 and you have um, more than 45 percent of the population uh, being at risk. And here is a slide that I want you to keep in mind. You have people that are poor and are working. 22.5 percent of the poor are in um, that status. They are employed. But among the unemployed, you have 70% that are in poverty. The numbers are hugely different. 
And therefore, if anyone was to say, um, let's have an income support system to provide for those that are in poverty, um, you're not doing the right thing. Because in the case of Greece, in 2014, you are poor because you are unemployed. So if you want to use cash transfers and income support systems, there are 22.5% among the employed that are in need of a tax credit, of a cash transfer, something to elevate them given that we have been through internal devaluation in the country, so it is illegal for the country to increase not only the minimum wage, but any wage. So you cannot do that, right? So we keep these numbers in mind because instead of saying, um, do we want a job guarantee or do we want an income support system, we have to ask the question, who is it for and why? So if you want to address and redress poverty that comes from the fact that you are unemployed, well, you shouldn't provide cash transfer. First, you should employ people. You should find a way uh, to do that. OK, so the proposal of the employer of last resort, in Greek, kinophilis, which means public benefit, um, is a minimum wage job guarantee. I will take the opportunity of the microphone to sometimes answer questions that you raised, fantastic questions that you raised uh, earlier on during the uh, previous two presentations. Wage structures, should it be minimum wage? Well, in South Africa, in agreement with the trade unions, there were two wage, the, the scale, uh, was um, a double one. There was a minimum wage and then there was a minimum wage plus 25%, depending on level of skill and seniority prior to being fired, right? Can one imagine a situation where you have multiple minimum wages according to the occupation that you will fill in in the scheme of a job guarantee? Absolutely you can. Um, is it difficult to administer? <laughs> Absolutely not. We live in an age, as you will see in Greece, we managed in three months to put together a transparent system of monitoring and accountability in general. So no, it can be done. Um, don't buy into this uh, excuses that it is difficult administratively. No, if you have the will, you can do it. So I have several names here. Um, Minsky, Randy, Ray, uh, Bill Mitchell, Papa Dimitriou, Forstater, and Drez, because in 2000, it was, yes, it was about 2003, that I encountered the writings of these individuals and they came in that particular order. <laughs> so um, my thinking developed along the lines of the Levy Institute but was tremendously influenced by those uh, individuals. And Jean Drez actually, he is from India and he wrote a book about the employment guarantee, the rural employment guarantee together with Amartya Sen, going back centuries <laughs> of experience that India had with public works and arguing how different this approach uh, was of a, an act that, was, uh, that became essentially a, a right uh, of uh, being a citizen in a rural area in India and it was followed um, very shortly after with an act of transparency and accountability. So it was part of a democratization um, approach to life um, that they talked about. So here you see A, B, C, D. You've heard all of this already, but let's quickly go through them. Um, what is the purpose of all this? To offer the unemployed immediate access to a job, 
to tackle poverty and social exclusion by providing a minimum monthly wage. And here I include social security benefits, which is old age benefits, health care, and everything that a normal legal job in the formal market should provide at the entry level. To produce positive macroeconomic outcomes, for sure, um, this is the stabilization effect of the MMT job guarantee. To engage in the newly employed in production of useful work for the community, and I cannot stress this enough, um, it varies by country. Okay? So the needs, for example, that we wanted to see addressed in India were those that would allow people that lived in rural areas to begin their own enterprises, but in, in, in what sense? In the sense of cooperative building. And therefore we proposed public um, works as, um, as infrastructure that would allow them to do that. In South Africa, um, they, before the Levy's involvement, they engaged in what the ILO calls labor intensive infrastructure products, pr uh, programs, excuse me. And what are those? Um, very simple, uh, very simply, uh, building roads with labor intensive methods so that you do not have to spend your precious um, uh, revenue and exchange uh, uh, reserves importing machinery and hiring multinational corporations through international bidding to do that. And that made a lot of sense. That's what the ILO had advised many African countries and kudos to them. That's exactly what they should do. But they were neglecting something else. And what they were neglecting with 25% unemployment rates in the entire post-apartheid period were other needs, and those were social needs. So HIV AIDS was devastating the country at the time, and you had a lot of orphan children, um, and you had a lot of volunteers providing services at the community level to their neighbors that were dying from HIV. Um, so what we proposed was that you professionalize all of that. You provide training, accreditation, you provide the services for early childhood development, but early childhood development means nutritionists also and cooks and psychologists and gardens that produce the fruits and vegetables that you will use. And if you look at the chain of production that you need to put in place in order to deliver the final service, the whole idea with 25% unemployment was how do you link all of this up and bunch them into activities that are integrated, vertically <laughs> integrated, so that you can maximize the possibility of economic activity at the local level. And we were fortunate enough to um, collaborate with um, uh, some um, uh, our counterparts, and we did exactly that. So you ended up having cooperatives uh, run by women with very high value added um, production, type of production not only the vegetables, that would be 50% of the production, but the other 50% was mushrooms, for example, that were imported up until then in uh, South Africa, and it became the fad of the time to go up to Limpopo and buy those mushrooms that eventually entered supermarkets throughout the country. So, again, the orientation in those cases was how do you maximize one unused resource through financing, of course, what is the key unused resource here, 25% of unemployed people, but direct it and coordinate it and plan it, yes, almost like central planning at the local level, so that you can create value chains 
that can lift people not only out of poverty but out of unemployment permanently so that they do exit actually. You do aspire to have exit strategies recognizing that the program is needed permanently because different people will be coming in and out or some people will be staying for a very long time. Okay, so we came up with four um, scenario and my idea and I think this is what we added to um, a number of very important studies and very important theoretical work up until that time my idea was that because MMT was not going to be accepted anytime soon by any sovereign government I need to be in conversation with the ministers of finance because they hold the money and they will release them only when they will see some potential benefit. Um, their hearts are not crying, are not bleeding. Um, they are looking at balanced budgets and they are looking at all of what you have been discussing um, in the last uh, few days um, in terms of the um, idea and ideology of what makes for a stable, good economy. Okay, so we may think differently, most of us that um, uh, use the microphone these days and many of you from what I have seen, uh, but that is not uh, usually the case with ministries of finance. So I wanted for advocacy purposes to have a weapon at hand that said, look, we know how much it costs. Is it a cost? Is it an investment? Well, for me, it's an investment, but it is a cost when you look at budgetary allocations. So then, what are the benefits for the economy? Here are the data sources, and you can find all of this, as I mentioned earlier in our study. Um, uh, Silk and LFS of 2012. And you will notice a program of Kinofelis applicant data. I'll explain in a minute what this is about. So what, what was the purpose of all this and what allowed us to focus our methodology? I had two questions. One is a question that you have asked um, in different ways already. Um, for how many People, what is the size of the program? How big should the program be? Um, and of course, it depends on finances and it depends on political will and all of that. But it is kind of nice for us that want to advocate to have some hard numbers as to why we think it should be number X instead of number, uh, you know, 10 times X. So the first was to estimate the likely number of applicants should a universal program of a job guarantee be announced in Greece at that time. Mind you, the unemployed were over a million at the point that we are preparing the study. So we had to do a number of things. Um, we had to have the character essentially what is it that you're doing it is as if you're getting a supply response from among the unemployed should there be an announcement that this program is on tomorrow morning so how many people would show up that's what you want to find out and we use the methodology to do that and part of the methodology comes from this detail that i did not share with you um, in 2010, I was working in Mexico but had finished the study for South Africa. And I was presenting the results in the Berlin conference, a heterodox conference that takes place in Berlin. And here comes an economist from Greece, I had never met him, who was a key economist for the General Confederation of Trade Unions in Greece. And he came and he said to me, um, you know, this is not uh, social policy. 
This is policy that workers have to take on and demand. Because, as I had said during my presentation, we understand unemployment benefits should be there forever and ever for the first year, but once you become long-term unemployed, something else has to happen. And this something else may be that you require new and different skills, question mark, who pays for it? That's a big question during the transition, if this is necessary. But if you do not have a job and you're long-term unemployed because the economy is not producing any jobs, not in your own sector, not in your own, uh, with your own skills, it is not requiring your own skills, but it is simply not hiring, no hiring, firing <laughs> instead of hiring, then because it is a manifestation of lack of demand, no matter how you change the skills, the skill level, you're not going to find a job. And what are you going to do? You're going to go to another country looking for, for work, much like what happened to the countries in Europe, including Greece. So um, when, he found, when we had this conversation, he invited us, he invited me to give a presentation to the Confederation. And I did. <clears throat> I did. It was music to my ears that uh, trade the Confederation of Greece will take this on. So I went, I gave the presentation, and I did not know much about politics, although I'm Greek. I had been away from Greece. I mean, the politics that are not transparent. So as it turned out, um, the National Confederation, the General Confederation of Workers in Greece, um, had a leadership that was very much socialist oriented, PASOK oriented. And during that period, it was PASOK that was in power. We, were, we are in 2011, and I give the presentation, and the question that I had at the end of the presentation was, so how long does it take to set something like this up? like what happened in South Africa, and I said six months. Two weeks later, I hear the Minister of Labor of Greece um, announcing a program that was um, Katseli, Luca Katseli, a heterodox economist, a brilliant woman, that rushed into it because they saw an opportunity that was much needed for Greece, and that first phase was a disaster. There was no preparation, it was non-profit organizations Mikio, for those that are familiar with Greek terminology, that undertook it, and it did not go well at all. But they were very useful in one capacity for us, and that one capacity for our study is that they announced the program and there were applicants, and we could get our hands on those applicant records. And we knew how long they were unemployed, the structure of the households, demographic characteristics, income levels, and so on. So what we could do in estimating who is going to apply should such a program be announced, um, what we were able to get from those records was to go through a procedure where we could do a propensity score matching according to the characteristics that we had at hand, who were the applicants and who were selected as beneficiaries, and the characteristics of the unemployed at that point in time, 2013, um, that we were dealing with. So we were able to select those that were likely to apply. So that was step one. Step two, we used input-output tables. I am a fan for macroeconomic outcomes of um, a short period of time, not long-term projections, to use input-output tables. <coughs> Greece has uh, 69 uh, sectors. Um, so what we did was we created yet another sector, a synthetic sector, that com was comprised by the types of work that we were proposing, from small infrastructure to social care, you rebalance the input-output tables, and then you get your nice results in terms of GDP growth, tax revenue, how much of this increase you will lose to exports, how many jobs you will create directly, you know, 
indirectly, how do you know the directly? Because in the first part, that's what you have done. You have estimated how many people, <coughs> excuse me, would like to participate, right? So that's your baseline. And therefore now you want to know if you are creating this job guarantee program for 300,000 people minimum, how many jobs you create indirectly? Because in order to create the goods and the services through the job guarantee, you need to use some inputs. And therefore you create automatically demand for other sectors and other inputs. And therefore you calculate through the input output the direct and indirect labor required. Now, you can also calculate through the multiplier analysis of the input output the induced effect. But that exaggerates a bit the outcomes. And that's going to take time um, to manifest. So I wanted to give as much credibility to the numbers. I did not want to have any questions being raised that we are making the uh, picture look really beautiful, really attractive. So I wanted to go to and use the lower uh, denominator. <coughs> the characteristics um, of the basic elements of the proposal, 11 months, monthly wage, two options, 586 and 751, eligibility all unemployed people, selection criteria, and I'll come to that in a moment, prioritize long-term unemployment and income, selection of work projects. Please look at the list, because this is the list that uh, in fact we practiced when in 2015 we began implementation. And the total cost included wages, but also indirect costs. Because in order to produce the stuff, as I said earlier, you need to use a bunch of materials, including sometimes electricity and what have you. So you have to calculate that, and you have to calculate administrative costs as well. So the total cost includes all of the above. And <coughs> here you have the four scenario which is the job target. So what the first part, how many people would like to participate? The numbers that we get are 200, 300, 440, and 550, and how is that? How do I get these numbers? I get these numbers by saying the following. If I look at who was actually allowed to participate, who became a beneficiary. In the first phase, the one that we disliked, actually, the one that began in 2011 with no preparation. <clears throat> and given that they had very limited funds, um, the program was for 30,000 people. Okay, so you expand that 30,000 to the population of the unemployed right now through the propensity score matching and you get 200,000. Then you go to the next level and you say, and what if I allow 50% of the applicants to participate? The number then increases. The third option, the fourth option, so progressively what do you do? You change some assumption as to how big the program will be. But let me tell you that the number 550,000 is the maximum that we could find with the characteristics that would respond to a job offer. Meaning, although you had 1.2 million that were unemployed, many among the population of the unemployed would not want to participate. Why? They did not have the characteristics. In other words, if you had a savings account of 150,000, you were not going to accept this job. That's what we found out. So it is not quite accurate to say that you're going to have 0% unemployment if you have such a program, right? Um, I prefer to be more modest and to say that the program is available 
for anyone that is willing to participate, but it does not necessarily mean that uh, anyone who is unemployed will want to participate. Now, I don't want to go through all the nitty gritty details because I do want to leave some time for discussion and to tell you a bit about implementation. Um, but what is interesting is that through this kind of analysis, you can get to the direct jobs, indirect jobs, increase in output, and increase in tax revenue so that you get to the net cost. And that's, these are the figures. In South Africa, in India, in Mexico, and finally in Greece, that ministries of finance are interested in. The total cost and the net cost. What is it going to cost me? And um, therefore, I strongly advise you um, to go through similar exercises if you are interested in looking at this issue uh, within your own national context. Um, very gritty, nitty, gritty details of how we calculate total wages and so on and so forth. And again, um, had we had more time, I would go through many more details. But what is important for you to keep in mind at this point is, um, I want to get to point two, that the proposal ultimately of the Levy Institute was for 300,000 jobs at the cost of roughly 1% of depressed GDP, a little bit over 1% of GDP. So let's go to the implementation part and what it looked like. And we'll be happy to elaborate in the final session today um, any of this, but let me <coughs> run you through some of this now. Um, when I first started negotiating with um, the three institutions, because literally they were stationed in each ministry, um, examining everything and anything that you would do and approving, um, I was told flat out that there could not be a job guarantee program in Greece. Um, for what reasons? Um, corruption, capacity to implement was not there. It would interfere with labor markets, the devaluation, and that was the key argument. The devaluation was going to yield positive results meaning increase employment, in a couple of years. They know that. They know that you institute devaluation today, wages drop, but big time hirings will begin three years down the line. So they said, this is going to interfere. And I said, well, 25% of unemployed, how is it going to interfere? The program we will announce and we will roll it out gradually will be for 50,000 people. 100,000 people, until we reach the 300,000, you still have a million people that are out there unemployed. I mean, how is it going to interfere? Anyway, to make the long story short, the European Commission uh, was persuaded, and they supported us in this, and we began rolling it out in 2016. During 2015, not one program of job guarantee was allowed. What was allowed? Skilling and reskilling. Training programs. To train who? For what? <laughs> right? Okay. Um, please ask me this question in the fourth session. Why were they insisting? So when we talk about distribution of power that you heard about yesterday, um, I'll tell you about the lobbies in the European Union and who is behind them and why are they pushing for skilling and reskilling and who benefits from these programs. And how much are you going to reskill in two months' time and three months' time? That's the duration of these programs. Um, so anyway, the program of Luca Cazzelli that I mentioned earlier was five months, and therefore they insisted that we continue with five months. I said 11, we bargained, and we ended up with eight months. 
period. So the employment contract period for anybody that uh, was hired into the program, the job guarantee, was eight months. Um, target the most vulnerable groups, you'll see what um, that means. Um, counseling sessions upon entry and exit so that we keep a record and we know what happens to these people and who among these people should re-enter actually the program. And I included an optional training and certification um, day. So you could work four days a week and the fifth day you go to school during the eight month period. And it was all in IT. Even if you were a semi-skilled or unskilled worker and you had never seen a computer in front of you, you were entitled to participate in a program so that at the end, of the program, you no longer need to ask your son or your grandson to download a document, a federal government document. You can do it yourself. You can do a search yourself. You can do a job search yourself. So um, this became very popular, actually. But I also um, thought it was important um, to provide information about uh, so the social and solidarity economy. I was responsible, I had asked and I became responsible for that and I had passed a law in 2016 about the functioning of the social and solidarity economy. Um, so, okay, finally, a project-based approach to employment on the program. Who is to um, how are we going to organize this? So here it is. In response to the Ministry of Labor call, municipalities, so it is municipalities, municipal government that delivers the program, okay? Identify and prioritize projects that create public goods and services. Okay, anything goes? No. There were very specific interventions that they could have, which I enumerated earlier, giving a lot of priority on um, social care, on small infrastructure, and environmental interventions. But when I say environmental interventions, for example, forest management out of which throughout Greece were created um, a number of cooperatives supported by the social and solidarity economy law and financing that came from it. So projects uh, could not displace existing municipal work. Projects were registered online. So each municipality would enter the code that corresponds to their municipality, and they would uh, upload the specific project with photographic material of what it looked like now, or with enumeration of the gaps that they have in the municipality in delivering whatever uh, the project was going to deliver. It is the municipalities that identify the skills needed in order to deliver this service or this good, recruitment happens from within the public employment service system. But how? You have a platform, again, where individuals that are unemployed enter, they pick the municipality, the job, the skill level, they will provide documentation of the skills once they are hired by the municipality and they answer a bunch of questions that prioritize who is going to be hired. I'll show you that in a minute. Therefore, the selection process, the application and selection process is one where there is no human hand that can prioritize in a clientelist way who is going to be hired, okay? Um, the Ministry of Labor pays the labor costs, the municipalities cover the non-wage costs. So here is the point system that we used. Prioritize long-term unemployment and therefore the duration of unemployment for yourself and the presence of another member, your partner, your wife, your husband, your partner, 
um, unemployment because in Greece we had at the time, and I remember it so clearly, 415,000 households that were unemployed. Nobody worked in these households. Um, the disability of the applicant, annual income, clearly lower income has priority. Um, and then the age group, and as you will see, um, quite biased towards the 45 years and older, because those were the hardest group to find a job from the numbers that I have shown you earlier. Um, number of underage children, if you're a single head of household, and uh, presence of children, elderly with disabilities. Okay, and here is how it all worked. I'm just putting in a uh, pictorial form what I have described already, who announces, who does the uh, hiring, and so on and so forth. Um, and the rest that you have here, and I'm going to stop ASAP, um, are part of, part of the, the report of the ILO. Um, I want to only focus you, this will be available on the website. Um, there are, as you can see, there were many focus groups um, for the study of the ILO because it was a qualitative, it was not a quantitative, it was a qualitative um, study, analysis and report that they produced. It was literally monitoring and evaluating the program um, for two years. Um, so you will see that on all fronts, and this is interesting, I will come back to it during our last session today, um, you will see that on all fronts from a social integration point of view, psychological point of view, um, the program was very useful, very helpful. And um, these are narratives um, where people will say, um, we cannot live without doing anything. We want to work. In fact, people would exit a cash transfer program and enter this program although the level of benefits was the same. Um, and that was really indicative. So these are testimonials that say, um, we value the income, but we want to work. We don't want to live in isolated environments. We don't want to be outside the labor market. And in terms of the types of projects um, that you had in all throughout Greece, you can see here um, that Plenty was in social services um, and environmental activities. Um, there were some innovative things because the projects were selected by the municipality through consultations. And in many instances, believe it or not, I was present during the consultations so that the voice of the participants could be heard. And it was only because of that that you have Something like what you see here, when we started to construct this pavement, residents of the apartment block came out onto the balconies to applaud us. Why? Because they had asked for it for many years, it had never happened, and now it was happening through Kino Feliz. Why? It was not a priority. And of course the municipal government has to prioritize, this was not a priority. But it became possible through the program. And here is another um, slide that I do want to share with you because the anxiety level as people approach, that's what the ILO tells us, as people approach the end of their participation increased, skyrocketed because they said, and now what? Am I going to be eligible to apply again next year? Am I going to find a job? So the recommendation of <laughs> the ILO is reconsider the duration it should not be eight months. If somebody leaves the program and they cannot find a job, in two months' time they should be eligible to re-enter. And is that possible at the European level? Yes, because that's what they do. In Ireland, in Luxembourg, this programming now exists in seven European countries. It's not only Greece. Uh, the government of Greece now is a uh, right-wing government. Um, Tsipras was voted out at the uh, 
2019 elections, but they are continuing and they cannot easily take it back. <laughs> this is the lesson to be learned, that once you have a popular program and you are not under supervision, if we were under supervision, forget it, they would say there is nothing we can do, I mean the Tsipras government said it, there's nothing we can do on many fronts, right? So if you have a gun against your head, there's nothing you can do. But short of that, people will demand that a program like this exists. Luxembourg has one. Luxembourg. Two and a half, three percent of unemployment, yes. But look at the cohort of 50 and over, and in Luxembourg you have unemployment rates of close to 25 percent for those that lose their job and are over 50 years old. So Luxembourg has a program for unemployed that are 50 years and older. Um, so back to work now. And here I am with Nicolas Schmidt. And I know Pavlina met him at least through um, an internet uh, presentation, conversation. Um, he is the commissioner of the social pillar, the social rights agenda of the European Union. And yes, he's standing next to me, back to work now, because this approach of a job guarantee has made inroads. They are not huge. We never went to the 300,000, but we did go to 190,000 participation in Greece. When somebody asked Pavlina earlier, so do you go small, do you go big, universal? And I say, any opening that you have, to introduce the logic of the idea, much like MMT. MMT cannot be applied piecemeal. But you know what? Because you need an independent currency, and Greece has zero fiscal space, zero monetary policy space. I mean, we are part of the Eurozone. And very, very, it is very difficult to finance something like this. Guess what? Within the social and solidarity economy, we have a parallel currency that gives you the autonomy. So should we do this at a very small scale? Because after the law, you have only 1,000, 1,200 small enterprises in the social and solidarity economy. But what kind? Not cafes and not restaurants. They are high-tech companies. They are agricultural production companies. Cooperatives for um, self-sufficiency in energy at the community level. Okay? And why is that? Because through planning, that's where we put the little money that we had as a ministry for the social and solidarity economy. We privileged lending to those kinds of enterprises and we said no to cafes. We have enough cafes in Greece, right? Yeah. So um, <laughs> I visit them all the time, by the way. Don't tell them I said anything bad about them. So um, is it possible? Um, yes, it is. In Europe, and I hope Pavlina will tell us more because she's involved um, with uh, several people um, at that level. Uh, I'm quite pessimistic in terms of it being adopted as a job guarantee policy as we have talked about it today. I'm very pessimistic. What is the better way? Um, I'm currently working with um, two groups that are involved in um, community-based mobilization in nine countries. And I think that this has to become, uh, through cooperation, by joining forces with progressive movements, it has to become part of what citizens demand. It's not going to happen by itself, not at the current political um, conjuncture in, um, in Europe at the moment. Thank you very much. <laughs> Randy, should we save the questions yeah. for the last session or should I take one or two or anything now? Uh, why don't we take two and 
then save the rest because we're going to have a panel. Okay? Okay. Uh, how does this program work for marginalized communities, including prisoners? For, or former prisoners? Including? How has this program worked for marginalized communities, including prisoners in Greece? Prisoners? Yes. Uh, no. Former prisoners, release. Okay, uh, no. <laughs> the, the, this is a very good question. How do you engage with marginalized, super marginalized, let's say, groups? Um, the struggle was way too much uh, to be able to address all kinds of difficulties. All I can tell you is that for prisons, the um, in order for us to do anything, we have to go through the ministry. Uh, we had to go through the, the Ministry of Justice. And we could not engage at all with segments of groups, for example, Roma, let alone prisoners, right? Um, there was a very strict division of budgetary allocations as to what you can do when you can do it. So, sorry to say, no answer to that. Please. So the question that you want to answer. You said that you met resistance from European institutions Absolutely. to the implementation of this uh, program. And you articulated two reasons. One was, I understand, ideological, because they were uh, insisting that internal devaluation was the optimal strategy that would pay off in the long term after our death. And the second reason was um, interests. Was it the two together? Was it one more than the other? Can you elaborate on those two explanations uh, you did? Uh, well, I have to say that um, nobody will come out and tell you that I need to support um, those companies that are providing the skill upgrading and training, right? Um, programming. So how does this work? You have a budget and that budget is um, the um, social for social interventions, let's say. And within that you have categories of which ministry can spend how much. And within that you have line items that say for the unemployed X goes to training. X goes to wage support to private companies. Zero goes to the program that we wanted to implement as a job guarantee. So what you need to do is move categories, but in order to move from one category to the other, you need to have permission. So they will say, um, if you have a job guarantee, what is your exit strategy? And I would say, um, let's examine the standards that have been set up for the other two categories. So once private companies stop receiving wage support, they fire workers. So what I want to do is obligate companies to keep the wage supported workers for an additional six months. And if they do, we are successful. The take up from the private sector for wage supported jobs and workers was reduced by 80%. Why? Because they were engaging in substitution. It is called actually the substitution effect dead weight and substitution effects in labor economics when you use wage support systems. Why? Because this is a depressed economy, my friends. <laughs> Nobody's hiring. So where did these new hires come in? They came because there was a clear-cut benefit to the companies. So once we looked at that, 2015, we go to six, seven months later, right, from January, um, we move six, seven months later. So we say, look, there is no good exit strategy here for this type of program. What happens to these workers? They become unemployed or they never get hired. Let's look at the training. 
when we look at the training, has there been any study in Greece that the, they will find jobs after the training? Zero. So why are we privileging this program versus that program? Let's split the money among the three categories and see what it is that we deliver. So that's what took me nine months with back and forth um, to persuade them to allow for a first program that was 30,000 people and then to go up to 180. So the resistance was to keep things as they were and definitely the lobbying um, behind training, that's uh, the, the bulk of the money, that's where it goes, uh, was extremely strong and resistant. I mean, they entered the ministry and they tried to, <laughs> um, with some very strong men, <laughs> they, they literally entered the ministry. Oh, on, on, on this happy note, <laughs> I, will, I will oblige.